Hello, and thank you for joining me for another chapter of Sarah My Story. And we're up to chapter three. It's getting juicier and juicier and juicier. She's 18 now, so things are hotting up a little bit. Things are getting interesting. Now, this title of this chapter is called Fine Art and Kedgeree, which is appropriate just after Easter. And it kicks off with Sarah having inherited a mini Clubman estate boxy little car handed down from her step grandfather and also dad's providing providing an allowance of $150 a month, uh, which has been worked out to dollars, which is weird because, of course, she was in Britain, so it should have been in pounds. But this is definitely a book for the American market. So everything is in dollars. Now, she says, though, rather proudly that I would mostly survive on what I earned and so proud of that, although it wouldn't be easy. Well, in fact, it was quite easy because Dad's got a job for her. <laughs> Her first job at a flat sharing agency, she was secretary to Neil Durden Smith, a friend of Dad's at his public relations firm in Knightsbridge. Oh, so her first job was a temp job at a flat sharing agency, whereupon Dad's got her a better job with his friend. Her starting salary was 6000 a year, and so she threw herself into London nightlife. Now, she goes on to say that she was riddled with anxiety, riddled with indecision, and she needed help constantly to sort of talk things over with people and make decisions. Now, someone that I feel incredibly sorry for was her new stepmother. Dad's had remarried to Susan, and actually I read uh, uh, Ronald Ferguson's uh, autobiography, which was he waxed lyrical about Susan and she sounded like a lovely woman. And she sounded like she put up with a hell of a lot. Like I said in previous videos, I did like dads, but listen to this and feel if you feel the same sympathy I feel for Susan. Who would give me the time and care to help me show me the way? Mum wasn't there and Dad's was too busy. But then he had remarried to a wise and gentle woman and I rang my stepmother Susan about five times a day. Five times a day! Ah, oh, that would just be excruciating until Dad's would get exasperated and tell me I was being a bore. Well, yes, Sarah, you were being a bore, rather a self-indulgent bore. Gosh, the poor stepmom. Anyway, I ran an approval-seeking marathon. I wanted everybody to love me, I suppose. I was crying out for love. Now, she points out in a previous paragraph that I've got to read out that she wasn't going for, you know, Miss UK. She was going for Miss Congeniality, which is a very American thing again, obviously, <laughs> headed towards the USA market. But she was saying that with her vivacious personality and her desperation to be a people pleaser, she was actually very popular and had a lot of friends. So she illustrates that by saying, at cocktail parties, I was great fun, completely wild, playing the fool, wanting to make people laugh. But I hated these convivial evenings. People would be saying, great party. And I would think, what is a great party? I didn't know what fun was, didn't grasp the concept. So she finishes off this little section and I'll quote it verbatim. I worked hard, I played hard, which most 18 year olds do do, don't they? Five days a week. And then I'd load the mini clubman with dirty laundry and drive home to Dummer for the weekend away from London's smoke and stress. Oh, to the stepmother. So the stepmother had her to look forward to every weekend coming home with a pile of dirty laundry. I wonder whether the long-suffering Susan had to do the washing and the ironing of Sarah's clothes before she headed back to switch off and smell clean air and find some peace. Bad luck, Susan never found some peace. Anyway. <laughs> I'm being awful. Probably her stepmother absolutely adored her and looked forward to every single weekend. Not everybody is as bitchy as me. So in 1980, she dropped everything and she went off traveling with her good friend Charlotte Eden. And of course, they went to visit mum and Hector in Argentina and they traveled around. They ended up in Rio de Janeiro and they spent the night on a beach. And this is where Sarah first noticed homeless children and how much it unsettled her. And she vowed one day in the formless way of the young, I would do something about it. And of course, with her charity, uh, 
I believe she has. All credit due there. From Brazil, we flew to San Francisco. Again, they had no funds and they reached the Squaw Valley in the high Sierras flat broke. So they did what a lot of backpackers and travellers do. They offered to work at the local hostel that they were staying at. From 6 to 10 a.m. they cleaned the urinals and lavatories at our youth hostel. From 10 to 4, they, now this was interesting, they served as human chairlifts carrying disabled children up the mountains and then skiing down with them and then going back up again. That is worthwhile. I thought that was marvellous. I had no idea that people could do that as a job. And then from 4 to 10 p.m., we toiled in the local strudel house. Now, it's interesting. You know Sarah's podcast. Well, she actually mentioned that she got a letter from a couple that she served in that local strudel house. And they were saying how lovely she was and how welcome that she made them feel and that they'd never forgotten it and that she was a highlight of their holiday. So, you know, you do hear from people from back when you were 18, don't you? But Sarah was very appreciative of that letter at the time because that was when she was going through all the horrors and the disapproval and the breakup with Andrew and she received this very kind letter, more or less telling her to keep her chin up and that they've always thought that she was a marvellous person. So it meant a lot to her at that very fraught time. So the earnings that they earned took Charlotte and her to the Grand Canyon, to New Orleans, and finally to Palm Beach, Florida, where Hector and Mum had polo friends. So by the time they got to Florida, they were staying in the height of luxury. And she said it was funny because it was in Florida that she stepped on a tennis ball and actually broke her ankle. And she said there she'd gone through all these tough times, backpacking around Europe, um, ending up on a bench, you know, sleeping one night and cleaning lavatories and all that. And there she is in the height of luxury and she manages to have an accident and break her ankle. So she said that was probably uh, that I had been inclined to read below the surface of things. I might be wondering just where I belonged because she said that, you know, obviously her in a life of luxury probably wasn't suited. She saw the tennis ball and the broken ankle as an omen. So after six months abroad, she returned to London to make her own way. And she said that in those times that everyone that had a family with some money, even though she wasn't part of the aristocracy, she did have family, did have some old money, um, they were usually got their own flat, you know, and they shared it with friends. But the Chelsea house that her mother had stayed in when she first separated from uh, Fergie's dad had been sold. So she didn't have anywhere to stay in London, so she had to actually rent a room for $50 a week from Carolyn Beckwith Smith. And of course, Carolyn Beckwith Smith was also once, a, well, was a really good friend of Princess Diana's. So there's that connection there. So they shared a small two bedroom apartment south of the Thames, number 40 Lavender Gardens. Now, she says that Carolyn was her best friend, her guardian angel, with the patience of Job, because every day she listened to my problems. Oh, gee, Sarah, you had a way of landing all your problems on everybody else, love, really. Um, so evidently, she then got a job as a personal assistant as an art gallery in Convent Garden. And she really didn't have any qualifications for this, but she turned up at the interview and the boss took a liking to her and they got on really well. His name was Bill Drummond and his high standards made the gallery a wonderful place with its rich wooden floors and serene music for background. Most of my friends were account executives or some such, so she felt that she fell short in dad's eyes. But she later found out after his death that he was actually quite proud of her and her art gallery job, but he just never actually told her. So she said later when, of course, when she became engaged to Prince Andrew, all the press went running to find all her old, old bosses and old bosses that she might have only spent a few months with wax lyrical about how wonderful she was. <laughs> so she more or less said that it was all exaggerated somewhat. 
So she worked like a fiend for the gallery. That's how she described it. And she ate on the run. Carolyn and I were always dieting, at least when we weren't binging. Once she'd been on a fruit diet for six weeks and she had a drumstick of chicken just set aside in the fridge because that was her day that she could eat chicken. Sounds like the Israeli army diet. I remember that from those that era where it was you ate green apples, green apples, then you had chicken and then something else. I can't remember what the last one was. If you can remember what the last one was in the Israeli army diet, let me know in the comments down below. Well, she came home from the art gallery and ate the drumstick and it nearly broke up their friendship. It nearly broke up them sharing the flat. That's how devastated Carolyn Beckworth Jones was. Carolyn absolutely freaked out when she found it was gone. We nearly fell out right there over a chicken leg. Now, meanwhile, tell me if you think this is sort of, you know, remind you of Sarah's later money problems. I piled up parking tickets by the handful. Now she excuses that by saying I was rushing around, no time to check the meters, and there was no way I could pay them off and cover my share of the phone bill. So you know what she did? She just ignored them. And even when it got to the stage of the parking inspectors, you know, coming to knock on her door, she would just pretend she wasn't there. She would hide. Or she would get Carolyn to say that she wasn't in. So she was really reckless with money. All those sort of characteristics of her personality that led to so much trouble when she married Prince Andrew were already firmly in place well before she actually met Andrew. So we can't really blame him for that. So she then describes these country weekends, you know, a shooting weekend would start on Friday and you'd get a lift down with someone and then you would stay for maybe a dance on Saturday night. As soon as you arrived, you'd get a G&T on arrival and your bath would be drawn for you. And then you would, it would be frightfully relaxed on Friday night, just trousers, a skirt and a shirt. And then it would be breakfast in your room or you could go down and do breakfast with the boys on the Saturday morning. And the very hearty, popular girls would go out for the shoot in their corduroys and you know thick jumpers and then they would come in all wet and cold in their green wellington boots after standing in the pouring rain for hours and have a glass of sherry and then you would go out with the guns again and then <laughs> watch the sky rain dead pheasants she didn't say she did but i got the firm indication that sarah was one of the gung-ho girls that would go out with the boys shooting then you would have back to the house for tea and a bit of tally and then you would put on your long dress for Camilla's dance. She just used the word, you know, the name Camilla as a Sloan Rangery sort of name. And then uh, Sunday breakfast, awfully hungover. And this is where the kedgeree would come in because you'd have a lovely plate of kedgeree and an ensemble of rice, eggs and cream and fish all mixed together, awfully good. And then leftover salmon from dinner the night before, whereupon you'd have a bloody merry over the Sunday papers and then head home ready to start work on Monday. Now she says, now this is interesting. When Sarah got into a lot of financial trouble again later in life, you know, after she separated from Prince Andrew, it was often said that she used to send over the top really extravagant presents to people. And that's how one of the reasons why she got into financial trouble. What well, says here, after one country weekend, this is when she was much younger, I sent a thank you gift to the lady of the house, a mixed flower arrangement that might have wreathed the racehorse. And the woman later told her, you know, you really don't need to send such a huge bunch of flowers. Just a letter or a little posy is fine. And then Sarah observed that she felt like that the, the hostess of this house party thought that she was terribly pretentious for a young person who was living on $1,000 a month at most. But I wasn't meaning to be grand. I just wanted her to like me. So Sarah would always throw money at a situation, trying to impress people, trying to make people like her. And um, then after that, she mentions going to Verbier, 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 sorry. I looked up the pronunciation of that, <laughs> Verbier in the Swiss Alps. And that's where she found Paddy McNally, who was 20 years older. And he owned a massive chalet that actually looked over Verbier. 
And he was dad's worst nightmare because he was not part of the household cavalry. He wasn't into polo and he was a racing car driver. So just not done at all. Now, here's a very insightful thing. She says, most of my time was spent with Paddy's two sons, Sean and Rollo, who were 11 and 9 when we met up. Soon I was acting like family. I was their nanny and their friend. Well, were you like family or were you their nanny? And Daddy got a little bit of side action on I just, when I read that, I thought, I feel like this was a little bit of a use on the behalf of Paddy McNally. Now, he always said that he was, uh, wanted to make an honest woman of her and all that, but she didn't push it. And she said that she, you know, tried to be his idol partner. She was always terrified that she was going to get dumped. She desperately wanted to marry him, though I never dared to broach the subject. But there were side benefits. Paddy got her a better job with Richard Burton, an ex-racing car driver who published fine art books. And so she left the lovely gallery in Convent Garden that she really loved and put she was on a much higher salary of $18,000 a year. I was virtually my own boss. I could set my own hours and spent a lot of my time close to Richard's home based in Geneva. So she got to do a lot of skiing. She was a lot freer. She didn't have the arduous work hours that she had at the other gallery. So I guess that was a side perk of being with Patty McNally. Um, still, she finishes this chapter saying this, still, I still sought more, still hoped that someone out there could give me what I needed, not seeing that the incompletion lay most within myself. So I think we are leading up to the moment where she meets Prince Andrew and the romance starts because, as we know, it was actually Paddy McNally that dropped her off at that fateful weekend where she, I think it was for Ascot, where she first met Prince Andrew. And the rest, they say, after that point is history. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to join you next Monday for the next exciting installment. I'll see you then. Bye.